Hey everyone, welcome to week four, Graduate Statistics, University of Cincinnati, Exploring and Describing Data, part two. In the previous week, I started with a knowledge test about a particular aspect of world health, which is life expectancy. We asked two questions. What is the life expectancy around the globe? And by how much, on average, did life expectancy change from the 1900 to the 2000? I have no idea what you guys answered because I didn't request responses, but typically people tend to be more pessimistic about those um, issues of world health than data actually suggests. Um, but we found out through our lab that life expectancy around the globe right now, or, you know, in the current century, is uh, 70 based on data from year 2000 and that it changed from the past century to this century about 40 years on average. Now we talked about the fact that data is not information, that we need to manipulate that data set, analyze that data set in order to extract information from data sets. And statistics is the tool that gets us uh, to transform numbers in a spreadsheet into useful information. And that process starts with asking clear questions. I hope to have shown to you with the guided activity that the questions that we ask really drive what it is that we do with the data set. For instance, for the first question we asked, what is the life expectancy now, we had to ignore parts of the data set, meaning we ignored all the data about life expectancy in the, 19th, in the 1900s, for example. We didn't care about variables such as fertility rate. We didn't care about years in school. We didn't care about different variables that were available in our data set to begin with. We only focused on life expectancy in the 2000 because that's the closest year that we had to our current year available in that data set. So we did some filtering first to get that piece of the data set out. And then we did some summary statistics on that. When we asked about how it has changed, now we need data from both 1900 and 2000 to see what happened um, in a century in terms of life expectancy. How, how has it changed, right? So we would make plots that are grouped by year instead of filtering out one of the years. So what we do with the data set, how we manipulate it, how we describe it, how we summarize it, what indices we use, all of that depends on the kinds of questions that we are asking. Today, I wanna to dive deeper into um, the aspects, the more technical aspects of summarizing data. And we're gonna still be talking about the same thing, the same theme um, in order to allow us to not have to learn new things and think about new data sets and questions uh, to dive into some important concepts that I wanna make sure you guys um, have grasped about um, descriptive statistics. All right, so let's get going. So when we were engaging with the question, uh, how has life expectancy changed over time? We started by looking at histograms as a way to visualize the data distributions. And we created um, these histograms using ggplot, the ggplot function or uh, the ggplot function. And I told you um, that it provides sort of a, a view of the data density, right? Around each one of its, of, of the data ranges, right? So again, I'll repeat that for the x-axis, you have your variable that you want to understand. And on the, uh, the y-axis, you have the count, how frequently you've observed a particular um, range of values in your data set. And here, this histogram, uh, we have bins of data that go from 0 to 10, from 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and so on. And that allowed us to um, then count 
the look at you know R would look at the data set and say, okay, how many countries had life expectancy in the 1900s between 20 and 30? How many between 30 and 40? How many between so and so forth, right? Um, and then build that histogram so we can see the density of data under these in, in these different bins. And in 1900, we see that we have this big peak here around 30 something uh, years, which shifted much closer to 70 um, when in the 2000s. So the peak shifted. The other thing that histograms helps us see is the shape of the distribution, right? And before I get to the shape though, seeing the shape, being able to capture the shape requires some playing around with the width of the bin. And we discussed that on the guided activity that if the bin is very, very large, we can lose some of the important details to visualize the distribution. If the bin size is very, very small, it gets too detailed and looks more like a broken comb. And that's not so good either. So we want some uh, size of the bin to get a smooth distribution out of it, right? Now to characterize, to figure out the shape of the distribution, which I mentioned is important because it impacts your choice for summary metrics to summarize the data, to, to, to get a metric for what's a common value in that distribution, right? So skewness is a name um, that we, one of the, one of the dimensions of shape that we're able to analyze. And we say distributions are skewed to the side of the long tail when they're not symmetric. So here is a symmetric one that has equal, you know, the tails are about of, of equal size on both sides. And you have the peak right at the middle, but sometimes the peak is moved to one of the sides. But what we say is that the distribution is skewed towards the tail end. So this is a left skewed distribution and this is a right skewed distribution. Another thing about shape that we look at is modality. A distribution can be unimodal, just one mode, one peak. It can be bimodal with two peaks. It can be uniform, no peaks at all, or it can be multimodal, multiple peaks. We tend to look at unimodal distributions and statistics a lot, but of course other distributions do exist with real data. As you've seen in the little video I had you watch, um, that when you looked at how much people got paid um, over the years, it, it used to be way back when a bimodal distribution with a bunch of countries, poor countries where the, the, the wage was $1 um, per capita um, or a month, I don't know, um, and the in the other more rich countries where it was about, um, you know, around $10 a day uh, per capita. Now with uniform distributions, um, if you can think about a situation that would generate a uniform distribution, one example would be if you threw a dice over and over again and you would plot how frequently do I see a one? How frequently do I see a two? How frequently do I see a three, a four, a five, a six? If the dice is not um, broken, you know, I, there's a name for this. If there's nothing wrong with the dice um, and you throw it, you would get a uniform distribution. If you don't get a uniform distribution, you start seeing a lot of twos, a lot of threes, etc. Um, that would mean that there is something wrong with the dice. Um, so whenever you see more than one mode, you have to ask yourselves, um, am I looking at a distribution that includes two different groups that can't really be analyzed together, um, like the bimodal distribution of income? Another example would be if I look at heights of people in schools, in elementary schools, for example, we would easily see a two, a bimodal distribution because you would have the kids with a shorter height, the peak at a shorter height, and uh, the teachers representing the peak at a, a longer, uh, a taller height, right? So you would have to consider, am I really looking at just one population or is that are there two populations here that shouldn't be mixed up 
So it's important to look at modality as well. And here is the example of um, the kid, uh, the, the distribution. This is the example of the distribution I was just talking about, distribution of heights at pre-K. So you'd have the kids kind of here and the teachers kind of separate with you know higher heights more frequent for them. Um, another example for a, um, a uniform distribution would be if we looked at the last digit of social security numbers of people in the US, um, each digit is equally likely to occur. If that's the case, you would get something like this. All right. Um, so to think about modality, there is a trick. When you look at a histogram, you can imagine you have like the soft cooked spaghetti. If you were to put the spaghetti to wrap up the distribution, if the distribution has more than one peak, the spaghetti would show that shape. If there is no peak, the spaghetti would be kind of flat. And if it's a unimodal, it would just create one. Just a quick trick um, to imagine when you're looking at a distribution and asking yourself about modality. So life expectancy around the globe, what is it now? Has it changed over time and by how much? We said that to characterize distributions, you know, the histogram is really nice way of visualizing how you know, the data density at different values of the, 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 the variable of interest, but it would be nice uh, to attach a number to that distribution, right? So it, uh, shapes um, is one way to characterize it, but then we need, it would be nice to have some way of summarizing what's typical of that distribution, right? What's a point estimate that would tell me about, you know, on average, what am I looking at in terms of, in this case, life expectancy? And we have some options to characterize the center of the distribution. The mean, which is the arithmetic average. Um, here we have a typical symbol that you see around statistics for sample mean, but this is the population mean, right? So there is a true mean of the population if you consider every single person but then when you do studies you sample from the full population and then you would get the the estimated mean the sample mean and the symbols are different another way to characterize the center of the distribution is the medium it's the midpoint of the distribution the 50th percentile and we talked about that too and the third is the mode which is the most frequent observation when you're dealing with numerical data or data that has some kind of order, you can use um, mean and median to characterize the center. Those are better ones, uh, and they give you um, a sense of what's typical of that distribution. And mode is more used when you have a categorical variable where all you can do is count. For instance, if I went around and were asking uh, who is going to vote Republican or Democrat in our class, um, this is a categorical variable right the party that you're going to uh, vote for and that would be the only way i could characterize uh, the distribution of the responses would be through mode right what's the most frequent response and that's 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 you know what mode is for now mean median and mode are sample statistics they're point estimates of unknown population parameters what does that mean is that there is a true, imagine on this one question I just said, you know, who's gonna vote Republican, who's gonna vote Democrat. If you do a survey, there is the true, the true uh, mean, the, the, the true mode in the population, right? What is most frequent and what's, what are the counts if I asked everybody that's going to vote? That's the true parameter, right? But I can't have access to everybody, so I have to estimate what that would be by selecting a representative sample. So when we compute mean, median, and mode from a sample, we call it sample statistic. And we're trying to estimate what's true of the population. And we're trying to estimate a population parameter. So these are some jargon that is important for you to know when you're reading about descriptive statistics. All right, this ends uh, video lecture one. I'll be back in a little bit to do video lecture two. See you then.